The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to Killer Innovations. This week's show, we have another guest, Craig Letty, who's the President and Senior Market Analyst at Interactive TV Works, is joining me to talk about the media and technology industry, specifically around television, cable, broadband, wireless, streaming. Uh, Isn't it interesting, though, that there's some industries that get tagged as not really being all that innovative? They tend to get viewed as being pretty tried and true and maybe doing the same thing, maybe slightly differently, or maybe you know, more digitally, but from the standpoint of being classified as what I would call highly innovative, there's just some industries that don't get credit for. Craig, both as a journalist, but also as an innovator himself, has been covering this industry for quite some time. Full disclosure, I'm also in this industry, so it's a little bit of him and I talking a little bit of inside baseball, but Craig shares uh, some thoughts around uh, the industry Uh, some of the original people behind the industry and the struggles they went through that people don't are maybe not even aware of and how the industry came about, but also where the industry could get better. We do talk a little bit about the digital divide, which is uh, the accessibility and the affordability of broadband services to reach anybody and everybody. So everybody has the the fair opportunity to compete and to take advantage of the digital economy. So we do spend a fair amount of time talking about the digital divide, but we cover a whole wide range of other topics. So this is one of those shows you definitely want to listen to. It may not be an industry you're into, um, but I think you'll get some insights into struggling as an innovator, uh, how long it takes to stick with something before it becomes successful. Um, having that innovation grit, and uh, and just also uh, having hearing us have a have a fun and, and interesting conversation. So, uh, before we hop into this week's episode, got that favor to ask: follow, like, and share. Follow on social media, like this episode, give us a thumbs up, and also share it. Find others that you think would benefit from hearing about today's show. And with that, let's hop into this week's episode. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit killerinnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Craig, uh, first off, welcome to the show. And boy, it's been a while. I don't re- can't remember the last time we ran into each other. Most likely it was like I had a tech expo, but we haven't had tech expo in two years, so it's been uh, yeah, it's been way it's too great. long. Great to be back with you, Phil. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's been great. Um, probably a lot of my audience is not familiar with your background. You know, you come from a you know, from a, from a journalism background, you've been involved in the uh, media industry. And a lot of people don't think of the media industry as really being, you know, that much of a driver for innovation. They think of it as just capture content, smush it together, spit it back out again, right? But in your case, you've, you've been in the industry, well, a lot longer than I've been. I've only been in the industry 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I don't even qualify for Cable Pioneers. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on being a member of the Cable Pioneers right. group. Right. Right. Um, but I don't qualify yet. I still got to get another, I got to put another 10 years in before I can qualify for uh, for Cable Pioneers. But talk a little bit about what your view of innovation in the media industry is. I think it's an interesting perspective, and I think it opens the eyes to people who don't think of media as being kind of the the big innovators out there. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people think print is dead and journalism probably along with it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we've seen uh, so many different changes and I've lived through them from being, uh, you know, a reporter for a suburban newspaper, you know, all the way to being a, an editor for Cablevision magazine covering our, our business and, uh, you know, and then making this transition to uh, the internet world with um, primarily with light reading and heavy reading, uh, where the model has been, um, you know, to do news online and then events and, and uh, deep dive reports and that sort of thing, um, which has all been uh, good, but, um, you know, very challenging through the pandemic. And uh, I think there's, you know, a lot of uh, innovation that still needs to occur. Uh, now of trust and what's fake news and what's real. And, you know, I think journalism is in a very uh, tenuous position right now. I'm still a huge believer in it since I grew up with it. Um, but uh, there, there's still room for more innovation, I feel. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and I know you've had a background in uh, interactive TV, which was kind of one of those things that people kind of got all buzzy about and, you know, all excited about. And, uh, uh, you know, the, you know the, the buttons on the remote, you know, Sky with its red button to get drilled yeah. down into the, the next level of, of of information and there's been attempts in the industry to innovate but it we always tend to kind of fall back on the more maybe did the digitalization of the approach versus really changing the approach is is there some inherent you know something holding the holding the the media industry back from making more bolder leaps you know why didn't why did not why did interactive tv not catch on like we at all hoped it would yeah from from sort of a grand global viewpoint you know i think it's always difficult for companies that make it big in the traditional space whatever that is traditional media or any business to kind of embrace that new world and embrace it fully so they kind of send out the uh, the, the soldiers, the, the canaries into the coal mine to see what's cooking and if it's going to work out. And, you know, the real problem with interactive TV um, is you know, what we were trying to do was create the ideas were good. It was a lot of the types of applications and that sort of thing that eventually uh, made it onto the Web. Uh, and through interactive TV, through those same efforts, there was the whole invention of video on demand on cable, which was, you know, predecessor to subscription video on demand uh, on streaming. But at the end of the day, there was no real scalable platform. We were trying to turn really dumb set top boxes and dumb TVs into interactive devices. And it was just pounding your head against the wall. You know, uh, I, I re remember some of those um, uh, boxes had like uh, eight megabytes of storage in them. I mean, what were you <laughs> gonna do with that? And, and the, the boxes were incompatible. You had boxes from Motorola and you had boxes from, uh, from Scientific Atlanta, later bought by Cisco. And those boxes, um, you know, even in their own universes, weren't scalable and, and compatible. So then, you know, along comes this internet thing, um, you know, and just it's like uh, I was flying by in, in the left lane in terms of uh, innovation and attention for, you know, capital and that sort of thing. And so it all just kind of passed interactive TV by. But there were some good things that came out of it, some good technologies, a lot of learning, a lot of creativity. Uh, some people, it really helped to uh, launch or, or elevate their careers. 
And uh, it was a very exciting and uh, an innovative process at the time. Yeah, and I think it's, it is interesting, you know, when you think about, you know, what happened uh, in that past, I think a lot of people overlook the fact <clears throat> that, you know, we all think of innovation as being a sudden shift and there's just the great idea comes out and then all of a sudden everything just launches and becomes the kind of the big thing. When in reality, innovation's a lot slower than gets perceived, right? It's uh, the average set-top box life in a home is six years. So it's not like yeah. you're going to swap out 100% of all U.S. homes to this great new idea that requires new hardware or new something to be installed in people's homes, right? And that, you know, is um, fundamentally innovation, while it appears to be the great new thing, is takes a lot longer. I mean, I get stopped all the time. People ask about, you know, wow, have you tried it? Have you seen this new thing called podcasting? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I've been doing it for 18 years. <laughs> An yeah. overnight success that took 18 years to get ready, you know? Um, and I think in some cases, it's almost having that visionary that sticks with it. Right? I think about, you know, you think about media and you think about uh, the, the the individuals who were, you know, really the 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 anchors in the early days, whether that be a, a Ted Turner with the invention of twenty four hour news, and everybody thought it was the most stupid idea ever invented, or you know John Malone in you know John and the early work of uh, you know the cable industry on turning the cable network into a broadband network, right? And it, you know, and it took you know, literally decades of work to make those changes happen. So, you know, I, th I think in the media industry, though, we do have a history. We just don't, I don't think we get credit for it, for sticking with it and, and seeing it all the way through. No, and of course, the cable industry never gets credit for anything. <laughs> you know, a lot of people just hate their cable providers, so that doesn't help. But I think you're right. I think there, there's first kind of that, spark of innovation that spark of imagination and people say hey that's great and then you know the devil's in the details of implementing it and it's always um you know, one step forward two steps back and you know i i did in my career have uh the benefit of following people covering people like ted turner and and john malone and, and john hendricks and you know um it's always easy to look back on an innovator and say, oh, they were so smart. And like, it must have been so easy. you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, every one of those guys um, just about lost their shirt or, or frankly did lose their shirt and had to find a way to uh, to dig out of it. Sometimes, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul and all that sort of thing. But they they did stick with it. Um, they They didn't give up. They. They also, I always say, you know, I also teach um, courses for CTM, the Cable and Telecommunications Association for Marketing, Industry 101 and that sort of thing. And I always start by saying, you know, those people on the, that day, they didn't have an MBA program on how to start a cable network or whatever. They paid attention to consumer demand. They stayed one step ahead of it, thinking, all right, here's the next thing. And they also understood what the technology could do and didn't do. And if they didn't understand it, they surrounded themselves with very smart people. A lot of people you know who, you know, are some of the unsung heroes in, in these industries, but they do the heavy lifting and, and do make it work. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, it comes to pass maybe through their efforts or related efforts, competitive efforts. Uh, and, and you're right. It takes some time to get out there. Yeah. It, 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 what I have found, and you know, look, I'm new to this industry. I come coming from you know when I was CTO at HP. You know, and people think about Silicon Valley and the risks. You know, and entrepreneurs and venture cap. I'm like, you want to know people willing to take risks? Come to this. Come to the. Come to the cable industry. Here's people who are willing to write. You know. Billion, five billion, ten billion dollar checks 
to invest, you know, to, to expand their network, to do the build out, mortgage their homes, put 100% of their stock up on the line, right? There isn't, a, there isn't an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, short of like Elon putting, you know, money up for Twitter. <laughs> and even then he's, yeah, he's right. leveraging a lot of other people's money to put, pull that deal together. But he's, Elon's putting up a lot of his own money for that deal. But um, I'm just amazed, it, even, the, even the size of the companies, if you look at the Roberts family at Comcast or, you know, the Rogers family at Rogers or, uh, you know, you know, uh, Rocco at Mediacom, or, you know, you go back to any of the entrepreneurs who literally brought this up out of the dirt, you know, yeah, they've all achieved success and people tend to, I think you're right. People tend to write them off or not write them off, but kind of say, oh, it was easy. You know, you were in the right place at the right time. Everything just kind of fell in your lap until you sat down with these people and really hear, hear their stories and, you know, how they had to, you know, literally you know, you know, write write a personal check and put deposits in to cover payroll and uh, mortgage their put a second third mortgage on their homes in order to make sure they had enough in, in capital to extend the network or fix a network after a, a a hurricane came through or whatever. Right? It's it's very entrepreneurial. Even today, the culture in the industry is extremely entrepreneurial. And again, I think it doesn't get the credit. I think people don't see the story behind the story yeah and one thing that i'm really impressed with right now is you know we, you've obviously got the the big players you've got you know comcast charter communications now known as spectrum um, my provider altis usa you've got all these big guys through a lot of consolidation but there are still around this country a number of very small cable operators yep. And they are building out fiber uh, in, in big ways right now and very, uh, you know, working hard to help close the digital divide, right. and, uh, which is, you know, another passion of mine. And, um, and, you know, that's just great to see. And, and so there is still a lot of entrepreneurial spirit, maybe not quite to the degree there was in the past when things were really booming, but uh, there's still a lot of it out there. And it's great to see. Well, I think, you know, coming off of COVID, I think the, the broadband network, ISPs around the world did a phenomenal job. When you think about the sudden move to work from home and learn from home and digital telehealth, you know, so you could stay, you know, deal, you know, deal with the health issues of, of the pandemic. I think the ISPs around the world did a phenomenal job in response to that. I think now what we're seeing is, is I think COVID opened up people's eyes to the digital divide. And we think, and the way I think about digital divide is it's two dimensions. One is availability. Can I even reach a network? Am I living in an area that even has some form of me even being able to reach it? And then the second part of that is the affordability. Am I going to be able to afford it? And in fact, I th what was it yesterday here in the United States? Um, the White House, along with the FCC, and along with the, all of the major broadband providers, not just cable, but all the cable guys and at and and Verizon, all the players um, have all agreed to a to creating a broadband offer below a certain price point that then radically expands the affordability of broadband to all populations you know i think of the video that was played on the news early in covid which showed the two sisters sitting against the their backs against the wall next to a taco bell and they were using the taco bell wi-fi in order to do their schoolwork because they didn't have you know, broadband right. at their home. And you see, you see videos like that and you go, we, we as a society cannot let that happen. We have to find a way to address the digital divide. And I think this also points to competitors can even come together, right? AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, Charter, Cox, you know, Roger, Shaw, Video, you know, Virgin, Vodafone. And you know, look at what Vodafone's doing with the Ukrainian, uh, you know, things going on in Europe. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think this this shows that 
even though you may compete, there's just there's the right thing to do, and this industry does the right thing. Yeah, and I, you know, you're going to see a lot of build outs, and obviously, there's a lot of federal money and state money being thrown at this. You know, I think my my concern though is, uh, you know, you and I have lived through a number of government programs where there's been a lot of waste. <laughs> And that sort of thing. And I think, uh, you know, some of the service providers are um, a little concerned about what sort of strings or policies might be attached to that money. And are we going to see some outfits getting that money that aren't really committed to building and are just trying to, you know, make a quick buck somehow or trying to overbuild uh, other providers, which, you know, was just going to be a fiasco. So, um, you know, we spent the last, I also run this uh, interactive case competition uh, with uh, graduate level students, and we spent the last three competitions tackling digital divide topics. Uh, this last one being about um, once that build out gets there, uh, you know, there, there are still a lot of people who just won't connect for whatever reason. Um, how do we persuade them? How do we motivate them to actually get a connection? And, you know, the winning team from uh, Drexel LeBeau College of Business really came up with a unique plan uh, uh, based around students and schools. And it was uh, sort of a pay-as-you-go broadband model uh, where, you know, students uh, or households with students could... Um, you know, get more broadband, but, but have it uh, kept at an affordable level so they could do their education tasks they needed, uh, but, uh, you know, keep, keep the money down. So, um, yeah, so there, there's got to be some, some attention to what happens at the end of the line right. once that connection gets there. Yeah, and it, 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 it is interesting. N uh, NCTA put out a study looking at why people don't connect, right? And there's still a segment of the population that they, they, they're they not online today. And then they have not been convinced of the value. It's not, a, you know, in some cases, yeah. it's not affordability. It's value. Is there value to getting online, right? You know, it's not a way. If, if you haven't had it in the past, you don't know what you're missing. You don't have uh, a reference point to know why uh, you should get connected. and. You know, for those of us who live their life online, like like you and me and our, you know, you know, me with my five grandkids, it's, you know, my wife lives on her Facebook portal talking with all five of the grandkids, right? If I took her portal away, I think, you know, I'd be I'd be in a world of hurt. <laughs> I better make yeah. darn sure the network is working so that she can talk to the grandkids. So for those of us that do it every day, it's it's there's not a value question. But there is a value question for people who are who found a way through life without being online, and that's an interesting segment of the population. Of how do you expose people who've never been exposed to broadband? Yeah, and there needs to be you know some digital literacy training right. and all that sort of thing. And you know, uh, some people will probably never get connected. They they'll think it's a government plot or something. Well, so, um, well, that's an know. interesting point because one of the and you know, we talk about you know and I've we've talked about it here on the show a few times here, most recently with some other guests around uh, the 10G program, which is mm -hmm. the broadband cable broadband industry's vision to 10 gigabits. Right, 82 percent of homes today have access to one gig. And the network is moving to 10 gig. But speeds and feet, that's how the industry has always sold it. It's how consumers have always purchased it. But consumers' interest is much broader than, than just speeds and feet. Um, security and privacy with all of the ransomware, the headlines, um, ransomware shutting down uh, fuel distribution and hospitals getting held ransom. You know, there's some people that say, you know, I'm not online today. And I like it that way because I know all of my stuff is protected. I don't have to, I'm not worried about, you know, someone snooping. It's a conspiracy theory thing or that there's bad guys out there. I think security and privacy is 
quickly bubbling up uh, of being of concern. And it goes back a little bit to digital literacy, because what can people do? And is there an opportunity to innovate in a way in the security and privacy realm that lowers that fear, concern of being in, in an online experience? Yeah, I think that's definitely a, a big part of it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, unfortunate. I mean, we, we all have to be on guard, you know, all the time. It's just, it's, <laughs> you know, I can't imagine what these ISPs, you know, are having to spend on security these days. It's, it's just nuts because they're under constant attack. And, uh, you know, I, I email a lot of these people at these different companies, as you probably do, Phil, and there's a couple that it's it's very hard to get your emails through. You get tossed into uh, spam folders or blocked or whatever. Can I blame them? No. Yeah. I, I have to go back to good old telephones and calling people and say, did you get my email? Uh, no, it must have gotten blocked. But uh, they have to put up the big walls or, or else they're in trouble. Yeah, it's, it is. Inter- you talk about getting, you know, blocked or whatever i mean even inbound my 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 work email address um you know it it is amazingly how much spam actually gets sent and we're only 240 people right we're not like one of the big isps right but every company out there i don't care whether you're a big business or small business whether you're uh you know a beauty salon you know, everybody's a target from these people. And the challenge is, is protection. How do you, how do you do that? And I could, you know, and look, you know, what our part of my day job with my team is how do we innovate along all of the dimensions? And so the 10 G's on broadband, 10 G's on, you know, privacy and security, but it's also about network reliability. We saw that raise up as a, as a, as a, not a concern, but a desire from uh, the the uh, consumer, and then also latency, snappiness, the responsiveness of 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 the network. Consumers are becoming much more sophisticated on their ISP purchasing and what they want it for, what they're going to do with it. And it's no longer just who's got the best speed for the lowest price. There's a lot more complexity, a lot more nuance to those elements of the network, which kind of leads into you know the question that i get all the time is is okay you give we we're giving now 82% of the us homes have access to 1 gigabit service 82% of homes can call up their cable provider and get 1 gig service today what are people going to do with 1 gig 2 gig 5 gig 10 gig what's coming and that's the the the, the premise around the 10g challenge which is Heck if I know, I have some pretty good ideas. I don't think anybody has a really clear picture of that. But we need innovators, people with really good ideas to come up with the ideas to do that. Um, and I think the broadband industry is unique in the fact that we built the networks and then Netflix was invented and YouTube were invented. It wasn't like Netflix and YouTube existed and then the network came around. The networks were built, and then innovators came on on top of it. And I think I am super excited to see what innovators are going to do with 2 gig and 5 gig and 10 gig networks, the kinds of experiences, the kinds of next generation services. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big buy-in on the metaverse, but that's one that everybody wants to, uh, wants to talk about. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think your your uh, idea for the 10G challenge is really terrific, and uh, I'm really looking forward to to seeing what sort of use cases come up. I, my my guess is, is that you know most of the initial ones will be kind of large industrial uses rather than something where I'm going to need uh, 10G in my home. But who knows? I mean, did we need a uh, a hundred meg, you know, a few years ago. Who knows? So, um, yeah, there are those things out there, and I think the, the metaverse and virtual reality and augmented reality and you know all that sort of stuff 
Um, but, you know, and, and again, yeah, I go back, um, you know, being around this industry as long as I was, I was just or earlier today, I, I was, it was funny. And you talked about HP. I was, uh, I'm not at my home location and I was trying to connect with the HP uh, printer here. By the way, Phil, it wasn't very successful. So you got to come out here and fix it. <laughs> but but uh, no, we're connecting via Bluetooth. And, you, you know, your, your um, earlier comment about how sometimes it takes a long time for an innovation to really take hold and take off. And I remember when Bluetooth first came into being and I was sort of like, well, so am I going to use this thing? And it almost kind of disappeared from, from the spotlight for a while. And then it came back in a, in a big way on, on all our phones and all our devices. And of course we use it as a connectivity medium uh, all the time, but, um, but there's one that, you know, it kind of, kind of took a while to, to bubble back to the surface. Well, it's interesting. You talk about Bluetooth. I remember the first time I ever saw Bluetooth. I was I used to serve on Michael Dell's advisory board long before my HP years, obviously. Um, and Michael had me down to Austin to visit, and he we we were walking around, and he took me into um, one part of the building where the engineers were working on kind of future tech stuff. And a lot of people don't think of Dell as being highly innovative, but in this case, they had uh, a demonstration around Bluetooth. And I kind of had the same question, like, okay, it's short-range Wi-Fi. It's not optimal. It's not very high speed. Um, you know, you get beyond 30 feet, it's not going to work. So it's kind of a, why would you use that? Why not just use Wi-Fi? Why not just use something else? But Michael Dell was pretty convincing. He had a vision. And I would have to say Michael and some of the guys at Dell were really kind of the the uh, the long-term evangelist over a decade in order to get Bluetooth into being broadly used. And it actually was a a program where Dell and HP actually worked together on things like uh, printers. A lot of people don't realize it, but Dell for years was a reseller of HP printers. So they actually had a partnership uh, around the printer business. Um, but it goes back to that, back to that point of, you know, overnight successes that took a decade in the making, you know, to be in the right position at the right time uh, to be right. successful. Right, right. Yeah. Hey, real quick, talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned earlier about this uh, interactive case competition. And so talk a little bit about that. I mean, you know, you've been doing it for a while. And I think the way I think about it also is it's a great opportunity to highlight great thinking of, of students and, you know, you know, typically at the graduate level, expose them a little bit to the industry, um, but also for us to get fresh eyes on opportunities and problems. Yeah, so um, we're now in our 11th year and, uh, you know, Phil, nobody in their career path says someday I'm going to run a case study competition. <laughs> but um, we were, this goes back to those interactive TV days and, and I was helping to produce a number of little conferences about different technologies and we were in a bar because often the best uh, ideas are hatched in a bar. <laughs> That's where innovation really occurs. Um, and, you know, it was after one of these conferences and somebody said, you know, everybody's sort of saying the same thing and we're preaching to the choir. And we need some fresh thinking. We need like uh, some uh, thinking from students, from millennials at the time. And so we started a case study competition. The first one was out in Denver at the Daniels College of Business. And it was just terrific. It was just great to see what the students came up with. We didn't expect them to understand every little nuance of a technology or whatever. But in the early days, we would actually give them very specific uh, technologies to work on and come up with marketing plans or use cases or what have you, things like uh, network DVR and video on demand and a lot of different types of uh, innovative services. 
And then uh, we've done it in a lot of different ways. We've had uh, you know, fictitious companies that we show up that, that have a, a real world challenge that the students have to uh, you know, uh, tackle. And uh, we get what's, what's really fun for the students, one of the most popular features is we get a bunch of executives from around the industry, volunteers who join our coaches council and then the coaches help to uh, guide the team, you know, just provide their background and what they see going on in the industry. And the students really like that. So it basically goes about semester long. And then we all get together. And of course, we were doing it live for a number of years. But now that we do it on Zoom, it works very well. And we can get um, student teams from all around the country that don't need to travel. And at the end of it, what we really want to do is get these students into the uh, recruiting pipeline for uh, internships and jobs. So that's sort of the bottom line for them. And we've been very successful. We say oh, more than 40% of our alumni, I think it's really now about 50% um, are in the media and tech industry today. So that's been really great. So our next one, just to do a plug, <laughs> it's going to be called the Emerging Tech Challenge, and we're going to have students, student teams develop use cases for a number of emerging technologies, 5G, 10G, the metaverse, and all that. So that's going to be really interesting. And if we can, uh, can twist your arm, Phil, we'd love to have you as a judge <laughs> when it includes online on November 17th. The judges also are, are a terrific aspect of it. So, um, so if there are any students out there, or if you know a school that might be interested, uh, you know, please go on to, um, onto our website. Uh, you can go to interactivecasecompetition.com and, and, and uh, apply there. So yeah, and we'll put that link up in the show notes. And uh, yeah, yeah and, I, and again, I think what's interesting here is, is it is a great on-ramp into the media uh, industry. Um, and so, uh, it's those students who are interested in the, in the industry segment are learning more about the industry. Here's a way to kind of find out, but also contribute. And at the same time, um, uh, get, build out your network, right? It's all about your network. I, I could tell I can, I, I taught, I used to do a guest lecture at the D school at Stanford every semester when I was at HP, less so now. Um, and uh, Columbia University, the entrepreneur uh, uh, graduate course at, uh, at Columbia, et cetera. And I always enjoyed it because students were very good about staying connected. So there are students that, are, that were in the D school or Columbia that have reached out to me. They ended up getting into uh, the industry or became an intern working in my teams. Uh, to get some broader experience, so take advantage if 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 you're thinking or looking for a way to kind of crack the door and get in these these kinds of activities, whether it be working with the coaches or the judges or other students in these kinds of competitions, put together your own team. It's a uh, it's a great opportunity. Don't overlook it. And then and I, and I got to put the plug in for the 10G challenge. So 10G challenge, we've talked about it here on the show, but I want to remind everybody. That is a prize competition, total prize money of $310,000, $100,000 to the best idea. And it's $100,000, no strings attached. We know you, you maintain ownership of your idea. Um, you can use your money to build your idea, to build the prototype, to start a company, whatever it is you want. We take nothing. It's uh, a prize to, help or to, to encourage people to to come up with the best ideas in areas of uh play entertainment what's what are you going to do with one gig to create a, a future entertainment experience or learn what's the future of education look like or live you know live is around healthcare and you know how do we how do we extend people's quality of life uh etc and then work look Future work is totally transformed with technologies like Zoom and uh, the uh, the experiences of COVID. 
But what does the future of work look like five years out when everybody's going to have 10 gig networks? What can you do over that network to totally transform you know, the work world? And so for us, the competition, you have to have your ideas submitted by the end of June. So it's coming up really, really fast. So if, you want to, if you're interested in the 10G Challenge, check that out, 10gchallenge.com, and you can um, submit it. So, so hey, uh, Craig, as we wrap up you know, the uh, today's show, what, uh, if people want to keep track of what you're up to, you, you know, you're involved in a lot of things, whether it be CTIM or the, the case competition or uh, your writings and articles. If people want to keep track of what you are doing, what you're thinking, and and what you know, keeping track of the industry, et cetera. What's the best place people can follow you at? Yeah, I, thank you for that. Um, I, you can either go to uh, interactivetvworks.com or interactivecasecompetition.com. It gets you to exactly the same spot, and uh, and you can keep up with what we're doing there. Uh, and then you know, on LinkedIn, uh, feel free. I, I am a big believer in networking too, uh, as Phil is, um, you know, especially during the pandemic when we were all separated in a lot of ways, it was so important for everybody to find ways to connect and uh, be it through LinkedIn or Zoom webinars or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, feel free to uh, connect with me and we'll, uh, we'll build, build out innovative things together. Well, great. Hey, Craig, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time coming on the show. And again, we will have all the links up at KillerInnovations.com for both the interactive case competition, which is coming up, and also uh, the Tenji Challenge, but also all of Craig's links so that you can keep up with what he's up to and reach out to him directly if uh, there's something in today's conversation that kind of, you know, uh, got you thinking about... Uh, the futures of uh, technologies or the, the media world. Um, uh, Craig is known to be a very responsive and to network out. So feel free to reach out and Craig again, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Phil. Really appreciate it. As we wrap up this week's show, I want to encourage you Think about, particularly if you're a student or you know a student or maybe you're a teacher at a, at, a, uh, at a university, to get your students to join the interactive case competition. Uh, this gets a lot of visibility in a very big and powerful industry. It's a way for your students to think about uh, bringing fresh eyes to opportunities and problems and challenges and have an impact, and see that impact become real, and get their foot in the door to an industry that could clearly and directly benefit from the thinking of those students. So check that out. We'll have links over in the show notes. I would also encourage you, consider submitting an idea for the 10G Challenge. $310,000 of prize money is on the line. Top prize of $100,000 goes to the best idea. The best idea being uh, that idea that shows how you would take advantage of multi-gigabit networks to create something new, something that has high impact, something that's going to transform how people live, work, learn, or play. For each of those categories, the four categories of the competition, Play, entertainment, learn, what's the future of education, live, how are we going to make people's quality of life better, and then work, what does the future of work look like? Each of those four categories can win up to $50,000 each. All of this prize money is no strings attached. There's no uh, equity. There's no, you don't have to give up your idea ownership. You get to keep your idea, and now you can take this money and go build it and go start a company and, or do whatever, right? There's no strings attached to the prize money. We are looking for innovators to come up with the best idea. Time is running out. All ideas are due by the end of June of 
2022. So this is June of 2022. You want to get your ideas in. Go read up on all the rules. There are restrictions. It's restricted to certain geographies because of laws, etc. You want to go check that out. Hop on over to 10gchallenge.com. 10gchallenge.com. And you want to get that in. So these are two ways. If you're an innovator, if you're a student, case competition. If you're not a student, but you live in the right geographies, just again, because of national laws, etc., here's your chance to win a competition, to get the money to build your idea. Here's your opportunity. If you're, if you're struggling with it, you got a great idea and you don't have the money, here's your chance to win the money. 10gchallenge.com. So go check that out. Hey. Again, I want to thank you for taking the time for joining today's show and looking for feedback. So let us know if there's also a guest you would like to have on the show who you think would make for an interesting conversation, who's got an interesting innovation story or a unique perspective of a certain industry or whatever. Uh, let us know. You can uh, just drop us a note or you can go over to killerinnovations.com, fill out the contact form um, and give us some background. And we will track the people down. You don't need to know them. You don't need to give us an intro. It could be just somebody that you heard on another podcast. You think, wow, that would be great for the listeners over at Killer Innovations to hear. So just let us know. We would love that. We've actually had two recent guests on that came from uh, recommendations from listeners like you. So please uh, let us know. Love to, uh, to hear your thoughts. Um, with that, we're going to wrap up this week's show. We are uh, working on some uh, new announcements that are coming up, particularly around uh, the Innovators Network. So stay tuned on that. If you want to join the conversation, the community is still up and running over at the innovators.community, free online community of innovators. Uh, you can hop on over there, check that out, be part of that conversation. We're always looking for new, interesting ways to engage uh, the community. Not engage with us, but engage with each other. Um, innovators have to stick together. It's tough out there. You know, the innovation antibodies will always tell you why your idea is no good. You need a community of innovators who understand how hard it is and help you take your idea and get it out there. So join the community. Be part of the engagement. I'd uh, love to hear from you. And with that, we will be back here next week with another episode. And until then, keep innovating. Podcasting nonstop since 2005. This has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network. <laughs>